Michael V, Caliphates, 1041 to 1042. One of the most infamous rulers in Byzantium's thousand-year history, Michael V began his reign with the utmost promise and ended it just over four months later, blinded and reviled by the entire population of Constantinople. Coming to power as the adopted son of his uncle Michael IV and Zoe, the Macedonian dynasty heiress, he had something approaching legitimacy. Michael was free to marry a noble woman and create a peaceful transition to a new Paphlagonian dynasty with the blessing of his stepmother, who represented the beloved Macedonian house. Surely, this was the opportunity that his shrewd and hard-working uncle, John the Orphanotrophos, had foreseen when death came for the ailing Michael IV. With his uncles John and Constantine controlling the operations of the imperial government, and with the staunch support of both men, Michael V could look forward to an easy and successful career. How did he manage to bungle this golden opportunity to be the founder of a new dynasty? This question and others like it have been swirling for nearly a thousand years, and I intend to delve into this controversy today. Although it is often viewed as a mere curiosity and an almost amusing failure, I will argue that the magnitude of the opportunity that Michael V squandered renders this the greatest tragedy of the 30 or so years between the death of Basil II and the final extinction of the legendary Macedonian dynasty. To better understand Michael V, we need to more fully consider his family and its fit in the larger whole of Byzantine politics post-Basil. Basil II had famously never married or had children. His brother Constantine was married and had had three daughters. However, most likely due to Basil's paranoia, none of the three nieces had gotten married. And so, when Basil died and then Constantine followed him in death three years later, there was no male member of the Macedonian dynasty left, and all of the women of the dynasty, most likely the eldest sister, had long died. Uh, the remaining two sisters, Zoe and Theodora, were both past their childbearing years. And so the best solution in a bad situation was for Zoe to get married and for her husband to then be the emperor. This, of course, was a stopgap measure. The dynasty now had a ticking clock. Nonetheless, it was still better than a civil war for power. And so Zoe married Romanus III Argyrus. The two of them tried to save the situation by having a miracle baby through all kinds of medical interventions, but these things all failed and so they resigned themselves to just watching the clock run out, or at least Romanus did. Zoe, despite knowing she would never have a child, did want to remain sexually active. This is something she had to wait 50 years to experience, and she wanted to have a normal life. Knowing this, Romanus's chief advisor, John the Orphanotrophos, had decided this was the perfect opportunity to introduce the empress to his younger brother, Michael. Michael, despite having a number of health problems, was an exceptionally handsome young man, and Zoe was immediately smitten with him. The two of them became lovers, and this went on for quite some time. Later, when Romanus either fell ill and died or was poisoned in some way by Zoe, Zoe immediately moved to have Michael made emperor, and so he became Michael IV, the Paphlagonian. Of course, because of Michael's health issues and Zoe's old age, there was never going to be a child from this union either. But um, Michael IV did good service to his family by ruling as conscientiously as he could. In fact, he died under somewhat heroic circumstances, rousing himself from his sickbed to go out and lead one final successful campaign before going back to his sickbed and passing away. John had ensured that there would be a succession by having Michael and Zoe adopt their nephew, Michael, as heir in 1035. I know it's a lot of Michaels, but this Michael is actually a um, Michael from a family that would not have the Paphlagonian name. Well, Paphlagonian is not really a name, it's more of a geographical description, but you get the idea. Because Michael is actually the son of Maria the sister of Michael IV and John and Constantine and the other Paphlagonians. Michael's father was a man named Stephen, who during the reign of Michael IV had been an admiral who had failed miserably. And 
According to most of our sources, which have a very heavy class bias, Stephen had once been a caulker or someone who fixes ships by patching the holes. Most likely, it is the case that his family was involved in ship building because they must have been socially mobile, as were the Paplagonians, and that's why this marriage match was made. So most likely, Stephen was from a ship building family, which would be quite a bit different than being a mere caulker even if caulking is, of course, involved in building a ship. So when Michael V came to power, his family was doing a good job of entrenching itself despite not having anywhere near the kind of reputation, land, or wealth as the great houses of Byzantium. Lest I forget, I think it would be only appropriate that I now mention that Caliphates means a caulker. So that is why he is Michael V Caliphates. When his predecessor, Michael IV, died on December 10th, 1041, Zoe was hesitant to let the succession go as planned. She didn't want to relinquish power. After all, Michael IV had put her aside early in his reign, and she had been more or less confined to her part of the palace, which is probably not too different than what she had experienced early in her life when Basil II had been the overwhelming and overbearing presence at home. So she was interested in trying to exercise power in her own right, and Skylitsi says that she even tried it, trying to take the reins of government with the help of some eunuchs who were well disposed to her. However, she quickly found that this was a worse burden than she had realized, and that running the empire was a difficult task. So after a few days, she became overwhelmed by the burden. In the meantime, Michael's surviving uncles including Constantine, who was very close to him, surrounded him and showed him affection and support, saying that this young man, who was now perhaps about 20, was qualified, that he would do a great job, and that they would support him all the way. And eventually, John was able to talk Zoe into allowing Michael to succeed on the grounds that she would continue to be the effective ruler, and Michael would simply be the male mouthpiece, that he would be there largely in a ceremonial capacity, at least for now, and Zoe would rule through him. Zoe was satisfied with this and also apparently relieved to not have to actually go through all the motions of government by herself. And so on December 13th, she announced that Michael V would become the next emperor. What people wanted to see out of young Michael is that he was deferential and that he wouldn't rock the boat. And the performance that he gave at his coronation assured people that this is exactly what they would get from him, that he would be pliant and that things would continue along the same track. The emperor would still be named Michael and nothing would really change except that the emperor would no longer be suffering from a horrific and debilitating disease. Michael swore oaths to obey Zoe and treated her publicly with the kind of deference that one would expect a son to present to his mother. So this was pleasing to Zoe and apparently Michael at this early date enjoyed her full support and trust. Michael also praised the wisdom and administrative prowess of his uncle John, who by this point had been in charge for around 10 years in terms of running the government on a day-to-day -day basis. All of this seemed well and good, but Pacellus tells us that John understood that his nephew would be a problem and that his nephew would betray him in the near future. Everyone else, however, was completely convinced of his sincerity. I have a problem with that story, though. Why would John, if he was aware of his nephew's designs, just allow them to go on? Why didn't he crack down early? And why, when Michael started to show signs of resistance, did John flee the city only to then be summoned back and punished? Why would he leave his nephew alone to plot if he thought that this was going to be a problem all along? Um, my suspicion is that this is a planted story, kind of like the sort of uh, post facto omens that were so common in, say, Plutarch and Suetonius and in the classical tradition. So my suspicion is that if this was a fake performance, as Pacella seems to think, that John was brought was taken in by it just as much as anyone else. Before we get into the details of Michael's reign and the rapid sequence of events that would lead to his downfall, 
I'd like to consider the question of why he so abruptly turned on his own family and what his motivations might have been. Michael Pacellus tells us that his uncle Constantine had been courting him ever since he was named Caesar and that Constantine was effectively jealous of John's position and wanted to become the new man behind the curtain for the Paphlagonian dynasty. Perhaps that was partly what was happening, but that doesn't really seem to explain the whole thing. Pacellus also tells us that Michael feared and hated his family and wanted to get rid of them. Now, why would that make sense? Well, it kind of does make sense if we consider that Michael V is not a full-fledged member of the family. Again, his mother was the sister of Michael IV and John and Constantine. And so perhaps he felt like because of the failure of his father, Stephen, that he was not fully accepted by this group and that he needed to really branch out and do something for himself. It's also possible that Michael saw Zoe as a foolish old woman. She, after all, had by this point done some somewhat questionable things, especially taking on a, a, a much younger lover and expecting him to love her as much as she loved him. Uh, she also had proven herself incapable of actually governing when she had tried. And so he perhaps thought that she was an unnecessary ornament, sort of this relic from the Macedonian past, and that it was time for a new beginning, his beginning, and that she was merely in the way. So those could be some factors. Now, there have been older historians, such as J.B. Bury, who wrote over 100 years ago at this point, who thought that Michael had envisioned a completely different policy approach. Now, what exactly that would entail, given the um, bureaucratic machinery of the day, I can't really say. I mean, certainly he could not have enacted any kind of radical legislation, given what the imperial bureaucracy was capable of. Um, so because we have no direct evidence of any kind of sweeping change, I will discount that possibility for now. Just know that I guess there is a possibility he had a grander scheme in mind, but most likely it's due to the idea that he wants to clear the deck and rule in his own right and not have any immediate rivals to his power. During one of the Senate processions, he was also heavily cheered. So he was in procession with his new mother, Zoe. And so when the cheers came in, probably for her, but they came in at both of them, he thought this meant that he had public support and that the people would back him if push came to shove of Zoe. If so, this means that the inexperienced young man had badly misinterpreted the public will. The precise chronology of Michael's reign is not entirely clear. However, based on my reading of it, most likely the first thing that he did that signaled to his uncle John that he was his own man was when he decided to go against John's advice and recall from exile some enemies of the previous administration. Probably the most shocking of his recalls was George Maniakis. Maniakis had been his father's former foe. The two of them had literally come to blows over the conduct of a campaign in Sicily during Michael IV's reign. Maniakis was restored to favor, and in the following year, 1043, he would go on to do some important work once again in Italy. Another man who would go on to achieve significance the next year was Michael Carularius. He had been a major figure in the church for a while, but he had fallen afoul of the powers that be sometime during Michael IV's reign. After he was recalled, he was in a good position to run for and receive the office of patriarch in 1043. Speaking of someone else who would have been around in 1043 but didn't do anything of note that year, the long-suffering former Duke of Antioch, Constantine Dalasenos. So he had been, at one point, a rising star in the empire, he had even been one of the major candidates to take the hand of Zoe and become emperor, but perhaps because he had been a little slow to get back to Constantinople, that honor had gone to Romanus Argyrus instead. Nonetheless, Constantine was freed, and he would go on to further indignities later on, but for now at least he was no longer being held as a captive. This showed above all else that Michael V was letting bygones be bygones, for one, 
and more importantly, that he was not his uncle, despite the fact that they were related, and that he was sort of setting the reset button when it came to his relations with various members of the Byzantine aristocracy. Earlier in the video, I referred to J.B. Bury and his theory that there had been some sort of ideological or policy motivation behind Michael's actions. The one thing that might kind of be evidence of that is that both Pacellus and Scylitzi's note that Michael was trying to court a different constituency while emperor. Pacellus especially emphasizes this, saying that Michael was really trying to win over craftsmen and merchants through his favors. And he doesn't really say what those favors are, but one can guess that they must have been financial in nature. Perhaps this meant something like tax relief or some sort of subsidy. It's not entirely clear. And Scylitzi's notes that Michael was counting upon getting popular support but doesn't make any mention of how exactly he had been trying to court it. Now, most likely, Michael was not going after the average citizen in Constantinople, but rather the more prominent and prosperous men in the business community who were still not quite figured into the political establishment. So if he kind of deals them in, then they will owe their entry into politics to him and therefore their allegiance. This was, if this is the case, if this is accurate, then that would mean this is a fairly shrewd strategy, and had he played this out over a longer period of time, it may have even worked. This is a way that Roman politicians in the Republic, for instance, had grown their voter base, is by helping to spread citizenship and other benefits to different areas of Italy. So whichever senator was responsible would gain political support. So what Michael's doing, if that is in fact an accurate read of this, that would be a rather wise move. That being said, it's also very possible that Pacellus, who was very proud of his literary education, was merely showing us that he's read all the classical historians and was providing us with a literary trope to try to indicate that Michael must have been a bad ruler because only bad rulers like Nero are concerned with the support of the people. We have to remember too that Pacellus was an extremely snobbish writer, even by Byzantine standards, and that Michael, because of his father's supposed profession, was viewed as being a little bit lesser than when compared to some of the other members of Byzantium's leading families. When it comes to describing how Michael got rid of his uncles, our two major sources are somewhat at odds, but mostly that is because Scylitzes does not try to go into any kind of detail on it. One of them does say, however, that Zoe was backing Michael's efforts. So perhaps Michael had an important ally in the form of Zoe. Pacellus tells us that Michael's arrogant behavior, especially his ignoring of advice from John, drove all of his uncles off, even Constantine, who was the most loyal of the uncles, and that when they retreated to their private estates, he then moved to pass decrees, have them arrested, and put charges on them. Michael moved pretty quickly. He didn't waste a lot of time. So once his uncles were out of town, within about a week or so, he had them arrested, and then he forced them to take monastic vows to go into exile, and even had all of them castrated, supposedly. So all this is a very harsh punishment, but it does mean that Michael had a very clear plan, that Michael intended to narrow down the scope of his new dynasty, to just himself and his line, and that he didn't want any cadet branches stemming from his uncles whom he didn't fully trust. Now, the castration part might be a bit of an exaggeration on the part of the sources, and it's also not specified whether Constantine's favorite uncle was included. We know that Constantine was quickly restored to favor after they had had a brief falling out, and that Constantine remained by his side to the very end. So most likely, I'm guessing that Constantine was able to keep his testicles if he and Michael remained on speaking terms. Now, had this reign been much longer and Constantine came back several years later, then perhaps it's possible he had this done to him. But given that he was showing no ill effects from a castration and was at his nephew's side the whole time, I'm guessing that he had not undergone any kind of brutal physical surgery. Constantine, of course, would go on to earn the title of Nobilissimos, 
And at least one account says that this was the agreement all along, that Constantine would be rewarded with a promotion once Michael came to power and got rid of the other Paphlagonians. However, it's most likely that Michael simply selected Constantine because he trusted him the most. As we mentioned earlier, there's a pretty good chance that Zoe aided Michael in his palace coup against his uncles. Now, she was his next target. Most likely this took her by surprise. Zoe was never the most politically gifted person. Michael suspected that Zoe had killed both Romanus and his uncle Michael. Now, how exactly she'd be responsible for Michael IV's death is anyone's guess, and if Michael did have that belief, then he was probably the only person in the world who thought that. Nonetheless, he was the man with power, and so his beliefs, however wrong they might be, were the ones that held sway. Pacella says that Michael's first move was to find a new ally with whom to take down Zoe. So now he went to the patriarch Alexius Studites. Alexius had been patriarch for quite a while, and most likely Michael thought that Alexius would be rather grateful. After all, Michael had just gotten rid of John. John had actually not only tried to depose the patriarch, but to take the spot for himself back in 1037. That had failed, and Alexius had clung on the power. Nonetheless, uh, despite that and a bribe, the Patriarch would not be won over to Michael's cause, since if he did have a grievance, it was with the Paphlagonians and not with the Macedonian dynasty. Michael decided to declare Zoe guilty of poisoning and then had her arrested, sent her to Prinkapo, which is an island not far from the city, and prepared himself to deliver the announcement to the city perhaps thinking that things would go rather well. After all, his arrest of her had gone without incident, his men had obeyed, and so things were coming together rather nicely. I don't want to get sidetracked into a discussion of modern politics, but I would like to make an analogy in order to make it more clear just how badly Michael's announcement backfired. Perhaps the biggest failed announcement in recent memory would be Jeb Bush's presidential announcement, which I assume happened in 2015 for the nomination in 2016. He was effectively coronated by the media, got all kinds of coverage, raised a bunch of money, and no one cared. I remember in Columbus, Ohio, where I was living at the time, there was actually an event to hear Jeb speak about foreign policy. When they realized no one was going to show up, they started offering food and even offering to pay people 25 bucks to attend. So you could get paid, fed, and get a free uh, opportunity to hear a candidate speak and ask questions, and yet they still had, I don't think they filled that one up. So Jeb's whole campaign would count as a massive failure, but by comparison with what happens with Michael's announcement, it was a brilliant success. So what happens with Michael is that despite his outreach to the Patriarch, the Patriarch decides to oppose the removal of Zoe and declares himself to be an enemy of Michael. So Michael not only has to get rid of Zoe, he now has to arrest the Patriarch as well. And again, this is a Patriarch who's been in power for about a decade and a half by this point, which was relatively unusual. Not that many Patriarchs lasted for a long time. Most of them were pretty old and they often tended to uh, be removed at the behest of the emperor. So not only did Michael's prefect of the city have to announce that Zoe had been arrested and charged with effectively treason, but also that the patriarch had been arrested for similar reasons. So this all seemed very suspicious from the outset. And another thing that Michael had not realized before is just how damn popular the Macedonian dynasty was. This dynasty had been in power for about 200 years by this point, and they had overseen prosperity and a lot of expansion. People knew that the Macedonians had done well for them, and they possibly assumed that it was the will of God for the Macedonians to remain in power. And so when they heard that Michael had arrested and sidelined Zoe and their patriarch, they immediately began to demand Zoe's restoration. They said, we don't want the caulker, we want our mother Zoe. 
In the meantime, Alexius didn't have any trouble bribing his jailers. Perhaps he used the bribe money that was given to him to bribe his jailers. He escaped, and then he went to public forums and started to rouse the people in order to free the Empress Zoe. So this was going about as poorly as it possibly could. Even Jeb Bush would laugh at how badly this went. Michael most likely was not visible to the crowd when the announcement was made, but he was probably not out of earshot. And so rather than hearing the cheering that he might have expected, or the sullen acceptance that he might have been willing to live with, he instead heard chants that most likely hurt his feelings. He heard the crowd demand the restoration of our mother Zoe, and also to say that they had no interest in having any dealings with the Cocker Michael. For him, this actually might have been a little shocking, not only that he had misread the public so badly, but also that people thought of him as a Cocker. So for most of his life that he could remember, he had always been a member of a politically powerful family. His uncle had been emperor and he had been heir to the throne. So this must have all come as a horrible shock to him that the public still did not hold him in nearly as high regard as they held Zoe. And so while all this is happening, the crowd's negative reactions and jeers quickly turned to violence as the crowd began to arm itself and march on the palace. Michael was being besieged effectively, and one of our sources talks about how he had stationed javelin men and others to fire upon the crowd and keep them at bay. Knowing that he would not hold them off indefinitely, and perhaps that some of his men were not fully loyal, he also uh, panicked and sent for Zoe. So a ship was dispatched to fetch Zoe and bring her back to the palace. When she arrived, she was still dressed in a nun's habit, and so Michael put her in front of the crowd. She said the words they agreed upon, but those words did not have the desired effect, as the crowd was angry that she was being treated in this way and that she had been sidelined unjustly. So the crowd was flamed on even more. While all this was happening, some other people from the initial announcement had run off and decided to put their weight behind Theodora. Most likely, the person who decided to find Theodora and put the crown on her was the patriarch Alexius Studides, because again, he would know where she's at because he was in charge of the church and had been for years, and also because he was now an open enemy of the emperor. So most likely Alexius grabbed her, brought her back to the Hagia Sophia. She was now sworn in as empress and then gained the backing of the Varangian guard, which proclaimed its support for her. And the Senate was divided. About half of them were behind Theodora, the other half were behind Zoe, and as for Michael, it appears that he had his bodyguard, and that was about it, and the support there was also dwindling. The only thing really keeping the crowd at bay, aside from his men's javelins, was the possibility of storming the palace and accidentally inflicting harm on Zoe. So things were going rather badly, at least for Michael. The stock of the Macedonian sisters, on the other hand, was pretty high at the moment. Theodora and her followers arrived on the scene of the upset at the palace, and there the two sisters confronted each other for perhaps the first time in years. Both of them had followings, and both of them had prominent supporters. Conspicuous by his absence throughout this entire process is Michael V, the ostensible emperor. Most likely, the patriarch played an unstated but major role in this negotiation, as did some of the unnamed senators who were present, and perhaps even the commander of the Varangian Guard and some other people who were there. Effectively, Zoe had the edge of being the elder of the two sisters by a couple of years, meaning that she had a slightly stronger claim. She'd also held the throne before through her two husbands, but Theodora had a cleaner record. No one had ever accused Theodora of a crime, and unlike Zoe, she also had not experienced any kind of failure. She hadn't lost the throne to anyone before. She had never been put aside the way that Zoe had been first by Michael IV and then more forcefully by Michael V. Skylitsi says that initially Zoe wanted to get rid of Theodora and may have said something to the crowd that Theodora should be banished, 
but the crowd as a whole, even her supporters, were of the opinion that the two sisters should rule together. After all, there was a very finite supply of Macedonian princesses, and there would never be any more. Pacella says that the advocates of each princess were loud, and eventually that the impasse was broken when Zoe walked up to Theodora and hugged her, and then invited her to live in the palace. And the crowd was really into this reconciliation. Theodora then agreed gracefully to co-rule while acknowledging that her elder sister would take precedence. So this ended happily and peacefully for the two sisters who had never really gotten along that well, but now would get along much better. Their relationship would never be perfect, but it certainly had improved considerably since their younger years. The reason I chose to use an image of B. Arthur with another woman is because Theodora, in my mind, has always had a B. Arthur-esque quality to her. She was very tall, she was known for being sarcastic, and she could also be a bit on the gloomy side. But we'll talk more about Theodora when we talk about uh, Zoe and Theodora, who will also get entries in this series. Um, Needless to say, an opportunity was missed when B. Arthur lived and died without there being a Theodora biopic. So what we need to do is have a contest, a B. Arthur lookalike contest, and the winner of that then gets to go on to play Theodora in some sort of biopic. So that is my proposal to Hollywood. So if any of you are Hollywood agents, hit me up and let's get this going. It must have taken a fairly considerable amount of time for Zoe and Theodora and the crowd to sort out the arrangement. This does not seem to have been something that was resolved immediately, so perhaps they were debating this for an hour or more before finally Zoe and Theodora had figured out that they would rule together, live together, and that Zoe would be the front-facing part of their co-rulership. When they finally had things sorted out, Zoe was the one who addressed the crowd and asked what they would like to see happen to Michael. And up to this point, presumably, Michael was standing there cowled on some other part of the balcony with his uncle, and they were simply awaiting their fate, perhaps hoping against hope that maybe the two sisters would just forget they were there. But that didn't happen. And when Zoe asked the question, the crowd responded unanimously that they'd like to see Michael lose his head. He had gone too far, and he must die. According to one source, Zoe was not able to stomach bloodshed. So while she might be the niece of Basil II, she had inherited none of his grit and bloody mindedness. Another source says simply that Michael V had gotten so deep into her head and intimidated her that she feared that he would somehow manage to get even with her if she were to punish him too harshly. And so she wanted to show mercy as a way to win his favor. At any rate, um, that obviously wasn't going to fly with the crowd, so Theodora stepped up and proved that despite her years as a nun and not really being someone who'd ever been politically active, that she was a well-educated and somewhat politically savvy actor because she came up with a compromise that suited everyone's purposes. She ordered that Michael and his uncle Constantine be blinded, therefore they would not be able to exercise power, they would no longer be able to mount a threat, and also, it would meet Zoe's requirement of there not being bloodshed. Well, I mean, there'd be some bloodshed from the blinding, but it wouldn't be bloodshed in the sense of killing. So Theodora's solution was adopted, and that's how it went. As for how Constantine and Michael fared with the blinding, Constantine was able to face his blinding with a good deal of resolve and dignity. Uh, we don't know that much about his life in general, but apparently he did have a reasonably high pain threshold, or at least he had the dignity and bearing to try to deny the crowd of the show it wanted. The same can't be said for his imperial nephew, however. Michael V apparently acted in a way that was unbefitting of a man, much less an emperor. He bellowed and bemoaned his fate, whining and crying and uh, thrashing about and behaving in a thoroughly undignified way. For the crowd, this must have actually been awesome, because this is what they came to see. They wanted to see Michael the Cocker punished horrifically, and that's exactly what happened. So the crowd went home happy, and Michael and his uncle went to monasteries blind and lived out the remainder of their days. It's worth mentioning that it was not uncommon for people to um, die shortly after the blinding uh, 
procedure because it could create a bad infection. And we don't have any other testimony about Michael, so it's possible that he died not long after, uh, or that he lived for many years but lived in obscurity. Either way, we have no idea. And in fact, the same is true of all the other members of the Paphlagonian family. So all of his uncles were also put in the monasteries, and we don't really know what happened to them, other than that they were no longer politically relevant. Michael V's reign was a very brief one. To recapitulate, he came to power on December 13, 1041, and he was blinded and deposed on April 18, 1042. His entire reign was effectively one big episode of palace turmoil. Not much happened in his time on the throne, but what did happen was very significant. So from the time of Basil II forward, there was a ticking clock as the Macedonian dynasty aged out and had no way to reproduce. John the Orphanotrophos had found a clever way for a peaceful transition of power from the Macedonians to his own family. His brother Michael IV would never reproduce because he was married to Zoe, who was well past her childbearing years, and then Michael IV also was not going to live a long life. However, he could adopt, say, their nephew Michael, who could reproduce, and then his kids by adopt his kids by birth would be members of his dynasty, and he would be a member of the Macedonian dynasty by adoption, and so things could continue. And maybe later they could proclaim openly that they were the Paphlagonian dynasty, or they could just ignore that altogether and move on. So John the Orphanotrophos had found a way out of a problem that Constantine the Eighth and his daughters had never figured out. So this was an opportunity that had only emerged in around 1035 when Michael V was adopted. But in the event, once he came to power, he completely fucked this up and the opportunity was squandered forever and the countdown was back. Not only did he squander the opportunities created by John the Orphanotrophos, but he also completely removed John and other members of the family from power and after 1042, we hear nothing else from any of the Paphlagonians. They were now more obscure than they had ever been when they were just average subjects living out their lives in the East. In fact, Michael's failure became so famous that future schoolchildren would be asked as a writing assignment, what would Michael say as he was being deposed? So this was a kind of creative writing assignment that made sure that students were studying history and thinking about the morality that drives great men. So Michael's failure was really a watchword, and when they said Michael, everybody knew which one in this case. Pacellus also has an interest in Michael's character, and he will spend quite a bit of time in his work talking about Michael's various character flaws, and he attributes his failure to that. Ancient historians of the Greek and Roman tradition had always believed in moral causation, and Pacellus picked that right up. And no one fits that bill neater than Michael V because of his many, many foibles and flaws, a lot of which may have just boiled down to him being a very young man who now had held power and didn't really have a chance to adapt or adjust or learn. But what is significant is that for several years, there was a way out of the succession crisis. There was this window that had been opened by John, and when Michael V did whatever he did for the reasons that we can only imagine, he closed that window, and so the countdown to the extinction of the Macedonian dynasty was on. I'm sure that, like me, most of you are probably thinking of what's coming, Manzikert, and wondering if things would have been different if Michael had just had a little bit more patience. Well hard to say, really impossible to say, but it's really, really hard to not think of it in the context of the later disaster at Manzikert and all the various mediocre emperors who filled the gap between the end of the Macedonians and the rise of Alexius Comnenus. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian, and I'll be back in the near future with more content.